Megan Bird Sanicki, and I'm a manager at Google's Open Source Programs Office. And I am so glad that you are joining me today for this important topic, open source sustainability. And I want to thank you for making time because we all use open source so heavily now. It's really important that we make sure it's future proofed and sustainable moving forward. And we can only do that together. So today I'm going to talk about what is open source sustainability and how do we combat sustainability issues? And we're also going to talk about how Google is contributing and how you can as well. So the first thing to point out is that open source has clearly won. You can see from this survey that 95% of a thousand IT decision makers said that open source is not only used in their organization, but it's strategic to their organization. So we are all relying on open source in so many ways. And as I've mentioned before, it's just really important that it is a viable uh, option for us into the future. And that means we need to make it sustainable. But what does sustainability really mean? <clears throat> Now, in short, it's about projects being resilient in the face of change. And this is well defined by a group called Sustain OSS, which I really believe is a great definition for sustainability. You see, open source is so much more than code. That's just the end result. It requires certain ingredients to come together to make that code. And I like to use the simple framework of people, process, and technology. <clears throat> and what I mean by that is that we need people to build the project and we need them to have all kinds of talents and skills and backgrounds to do that. And we need them to work together and work together well with clear, healthy processes. So they're really efficient and effective as they're collaborating. And then the last area is that they need a whole set of tools to facilitate their work, whether that's contributor tools or communication tools. And you need these three areas set up for success and to all be resilient. And when you don't have that, then what happens is you start to see cracks in the project. And unfortunately, the project starts to fall down on its ability to deliver great code. And it can eventually just die on the vine, as they say. And so you really do need these ingredients to be healthy so that they are resilient in the face of change. And that change can come in the form of many forces. The first one that's commonly known in the industry is tragedy of commons. And that's simply when you have people that have started to contribute and then a lot of people who are downloading and using the software. And those original contributors might be getting tired and those new users are not coming back to contribute as well. And eventually you just have an imbalance and uh, you don't have enough new talent to relieve those that are ready to move on. And there's just all kinds of stress fractures associated with that. The other force that creates um, change and impact in a project is how a project goes through different stages, through uh, life cycle stages. So it starts small, it might just be a few people working on it, and then it gets bigger and bigger, and it starts to need governance to tell people how to work well together. It needs more process, it needs different kinds of talent, and if it doesn't have the right ingredients at each stage, it's just not going to progress to the next stage. It might even go backwards. So that's another area that is pretty common with projects. Another force that impacts projects is changes in the competitive landscape. So you might have a project that solves a certain problem, and then another project comes out that solves that problem in a different way. You know, eventually, if that other project is more popular or solves the problem better, you're going to lose contributors to this other project. You're going to lose end users to that project, and you're going to see just an overall decline in engagement. And so that's an unfortunate outcome that can happen when you see shifts in the competitive landscape. 
Another common area that creates a lot of change, disruptive change, are global trends. And the most common one, the most recent one right now is COVID. COVID started and projects that were relying on in-person events and the funding from those events found that they had to cancel the events and they were scrambling to find money to keep their foundations afloat, to pay for servers. They were also finding it really hard to suddenly move into a fully online community. How do you run meetups online? Where do you get the tools and the best practices? Um, and so there's lots of headwinds like this and others that I haven't mentioned, but it is true that projects have to deal with a lot, whether they realize it or not as they're getting started and moving through their journey. And it's also important to note that no project's um, sustainability needs are the same. Everyone is in different places. And unfortunately, there isn't a tool out there to just tell the community, oh, you're having resilience issues. Um, and this is where you're starting to see cracks in the system and this is what you need to do. That doesn't exist. You have to rely on people being very engaged in your project and actively identifying these. And there's no training. It's not something that people normally do. And so um, there's just a real gap here in what can happen and what you can do proactively to get ahead of some of these um, stress factors in your project. So how do we make projects sustainable? What happens when you don't have sustainable projects? Well, you end up having lots of challenges and pain. And I broke them out into a couple categories. The first one's around people. Uh, you have pain with maintainers and contributors. So you can have burnout when there's just not enough help coming. Um, PRs can languish. And there might be great ideas in some of those pull requests that just never get to see the light of day because there's just no one there to take it to the next level. You might see other issues like a toxic community because there just hasn't been time to really create a welcoming space with good values and um, good ways of interacting with each other, um, good governance to ensure that happens, a code of conduct, things like that. Um, you can also have challenges with end users. They eventually might just lose trust of your project. Maybe they have security concerns or they start seeing there's lower engagement with your community and they're like, yeah, I don't know if I want to invest in a project that has declining community members and engagement because uh, that is a metric that they look at. Um, it also might be that there isn't enough talent in a project. It might just be totally indexed for uh, code, coders, but not enough tech writers. And suddenly a project finds itself with poor or lacking documentation. And end users need that documentation in order to figure out how to use and adopt the software. Another area is code infrastructure. So when a project isn't resilient and they don't have, let's say, enough funding, they may not be able to get the infrastructure they need to support the project. They may not be able to pay for servers or the tests that they need, and it could impact their release cadence. Another area where you might see challenges is the foundations that support the community. And a lot of it has to do with funding challenges. If they just don't have enough funding, they can't serve their mission to support the community or help accelerate innovation within the community. And perhaps they aren't able to fund the legal and financial support that they need to be a healthy organization. Um, and so these are just all kinds of different challenges that you might see when a project isn't resilient. And so what do you do when projects have these kinds of challenges and none of, no project is the same in terms of their needs? Well, one answer that um, we have found is that diversity is a great antidote for building resilience in a project. And it's diversity on a couple different axes. 
diverse community members, and diverse contributions. You see, some people think that um, there's kind of a silver bullet. Oh, we just need to get end users to contribute back, and that will solve the problem. Others might say, well, we just need to invest in better security, and that will make projects more sustainable. And these are all correct answers, but they're all very tactical answers, and you realize there's a bunch of them. When you pull the lens back, you realize it's really about diversity that builds resilience. And let me tell you what I mean. So when you look at diversity in terms of community members, we are very much talking about um, diversity in terms of including those from the various underrepresented groups. Because different perspectives make great solutions. And so you want diverse talent. And that's going to require different ingredients to be in place. You need a welcoming, safe community that has values in place and governance and culture that supports diversity. And you need to be very intentional with your outreach, not just asking your friend to join, but really reaching out to recruit community members so that you truly have a diverse member base. And there's so much more that you can do on this front that I won't have time to get into, but I highly recommend you go to all the many resources that are out there. The other axes on diversity is different types of contribution. And I like to use a pretty standard frame, which is time, talent, and treasure. You want your contributions diversified in these three areas. And this is a framework that comes from the nonprofit world and it applies pretty well to open source. And the reality is, is that when you focus on diverse contributions, you actually get an even more diverse community member base. So let me explain what I mean. So diverse time and talent come in lots of different ways. Um, like I mentioned before, you don't want just to focus on code. And of course you have to build code, but a project requires so many other talents. You need those tech writers to write documentation. You need mentors to help people learn the contributor experience. You need event planners to do meetups and conferences. You need board members that have board experience and so many other talents. You simply cannot have a successful project with just coders. You also need to be mindful of where the contributions are coming from. Are they hobbyists? Are they um, people that work for open source vendors using the project or end users using the project? You really want to look across your ecosystem at all the different kinds of groups that make up your ecosystem and see if you have good representation from all of them contributing back. And you also want to look at your global contribution. It's important to get people from around the world to contribute so that you end up with an end product or an end project that serves a global base that will want to adopt this software. And you um, can really lower barriers when you have um, more of a global community base. So for example, they can write translations so that end users around the world can really grab that software, read the translated documentation and put it to good use. So that's time and talent. You further need to diversify with treasure. And that just means funding. So you need money for tools like servers, like I mentioned before. You might also want money for diversity scholarships. You may want to pay maintainers and you need money to do that. And it's really important to diversify the funds. So you don't want to bring in money in just one way. You don't want to rely just on event sponsorships, for example, ticket revenue. We saw this with COVID, the projects that did rely on this too heavily, heavily found that they were really struggling for survival um, and had to come up with new ways to fund their mission work. And so you wanna think about events, but you wanna think about memberships and donations and uh, grants. Maybe you wanna have a product. And um, there's other things about treasure as well, but when you diversify treasure, 
time and talent, and you think about that and you ask what your project needs now and into the future, you will start building in so much more resiliency into your project by diversifying. This is how Google thinks about sustainability. And we put it to practice every day. And that's because we use a lot of open source software. We rely on it for our infrastructure and for the offerings we make out in the marketplace. And so we take giving back very seriously. It's the right thing to do. And it also future proofs the open source projects we rely on. And we have nearly 12,000 Googlers who are contributing to projects. And that doesn't even include people beyond uh, code and tech writers. So it doesn't include our staff members that are serving on boards or planning events. And we create thousands of open source projects. And today we currently manage 2,600 active projects. And we rely on a lot of external projects as well. And we're actually active in um, 70,000 GitHub repositories. And it's, it's a lot. And we care about these projects too and make sure we give back. We do so in lots of different ways. And so I'll kind of just break down some of the ways that we are uh, contributing to make open source sustainable. So the first example is Go, a really popular language that was developed by Go, and it has a strong and growing community around it. We have a group of people that are focused on sustainably stewarding the project and making sure everyone's working well together towards these common goals for Go. And one of the things that they found, especially during COVID, was that with this emphasis of online collaboration, we needed to make the project more welcoming in these online forums. And there really wasn't training and there you don't normally get this kind of training to learn how to moderate forums. And when you do it poorly, you can make some really bad experiences that are um, at worst toxic for the community and also just a real distraction from these common goals we want to achieve together. You end up just focus too much on the daily drama. We, we just didn't want that. And so we invested in um, moderator training so that we could help moderators with effective communication, conflict resolution, code of conduct enforcement. And we're really excited to empower these people to be much better leaders in these spaces and make sure we have a welcoming environment so that we can attract diverse community members. Um, and we're looking forward to rolling this out to other projects. And TensorFlow is another great example, another project that was developed by Google and has a community created around it. And we intentionally wanted diverse uh, community members as part of this project. It does not do anyone good if it's just Googlers working on this project. We need input from so many perspectives. And so we intentionally designed our governance so that our special interest groups always had a balance of Googlers and those that don't work at Google. And that way, decision-making has much more perspective and balance and ensures that we are committed to having this diverse community base. So we do provide these kinds of um, services for the projects we uh, create and manage, but we also have lots of programs to help make projects sustainable, both the ones we create, the ones we rely on that we don't create, and even ones we don't use. And these programs, we just wanna share broadly because we care about open source, the, the whole industry's sustainability and health. So a few projects or programs that you might wanna check out are OSS Fuzz, which uncovers security vulnerabilities and stability issues. And we have Google Summer of Code, it's a long-standing mentoring program that gets students into projects and assigned to mentors so they learn how to contribute code well, contribute right, and it's resulted in a lot of leaders in open source projects. Uh, and it brings in a lot of diverse and new talent into the projects as well. 
Uh, another program to check out that's newer is Season of Docs. It's a lot like Summer of Code, but it's about matching tech writers to projects and making sure that these projects accelerate good documentation so they can grow adoption um, of, their, of their software out in the marketplace with end users. And there's lots of other um, programs that you can check out and you can go to opensource.google to find out what they are. And so we have these longstanding programs and approaches, but we also know that things creep up. These forces of change like COVID just come out of nowhere. And we are, uh, or at least we attempt to be as nimble as we can to help out when these challenges arise. So for COVID, we did a couple things. Um, we reached out to the projects we rely on and simply said, how can we help? And we sent resources in to help where we could. We also knew that many people had to take a break from their projects because they were suddenly doing childcare or elder care or finding a new job. So we transitioned our internship program to bring more students into projects and assign them mentors so they could take on some of the load of the work and also learn about open source and how that can be a future career path for them. Uh, and then we also reached out to open source projects on the front lines. And there were many that needed to accelerate features to make sure we were really serving the front lines well. So we did a, a call out and many um, people within Google came, to, uh, you know, heard the call and came out and contributed time and talent to projects like COVID Act Now and NextStrain and Schema.org. Um, and we also helped a lot of projects shift from in-person events to online events like this one. We did it by creating a guide and sharing it broadly with the open source community. So these are some things that we have done as Google to help give back to the industry and to the projects we use and rely on. But it's really important to point out that we do not do this alone. Sustainability cannot be achieved by just one company or just one individual. It requires all of us working together. And we are so grateful for all the partners that we work with to contribute back and make the industry and the projects we use sustainable and future-proofed. So these are, you know, the things that we do. But if you want to get started in contributing to open source, you can do it today. And you don't need to be part of a big enterprise to make a difference. Everything counts. So here are a few pro tips that you might want to try right away. First is just going to the project you love and use and asking, how can I help? Trust me, people will point in the right direction. But if you don't want to do that, just go over and start answering issues or see if there's any languishing PRs that you can close out. And you can always fund a project. You could buy a membership, you could donate, you could even buy a t-shirt, that kind of money helps too. And you can look at our sustainability programs on opensource.google and see which ones might help your project and apply for all of them. We're happy to share our resources and we really want to. Another pro tip is to learn more about sustainability. And you can do so with this great um, resource that Nadia Eggball wrote with the Ford Foundation called Roads and Bridges. It really explains the basics of sustainability. And so I hope you'll check that out. I hope that you will start thinking of ways that you can contribute because like I said, every little bit matters. And this is how we keep open source alive today and into the future. So I want to thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in chat. And you can also find me on Twitter anytime.